Good morning. Can you hear me? First of all, welcome to our in-person service. It's good to see folks here. And with that, uh, just a reminder of the various COVID-19 protocols that we as a congregation have decided to continue to follow, uh, to which is uh, the, six, the social distancing, the, you know, if you wish to have any time of fellowship after the service, if you can take it outside to have a time of conversation. Uh, to keep wearing your masks during the whole service and uh, you know you can sing but you, know, you have to keep the mask on and just the, and just be an ongoing awareness that we're nowhere near out of the woods in this one we're now looking at we are we're in the fourth wave you know that's a given uh, the number of cases have been increasing and despite the efforts of the provincial government to hide the number of cases, it looks like we could be looking at a very difficult weekend. So we need to remember that even those of us who have been fully vaccinated, we can still, we, you know, I mean, we've heard of a fair number of cases, particularly in the United States, of people who have been fully vaccinated and yet have been uh, infected by COVID-19. And whereas it may not have much of an impact on them, it will have an impact on the people around them. Um, one of the ongoing kind of... Years ago, I read a history book. No, it was, it was a science fiction book. It was called The History of the Third Millennium. And the idea, the, the conceit of the book was it was written to talk about the history of the world between 2000 and 3000, obviously science fiction. Uh, one of the things they talked about was a series of plagues and um, how certain countries did better than others. And said one of the countries that did the best was the United States. Because it was believed that the United States of the 21st century would be wise and capable and whatever of dealing with plagues. So what happened? Why did science fiction turn out to completely wrong? I think one of the reasons, and I think this is something we need to be constantly aware of, is the pig-headedness of people. I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Why don't you wear a mask? Why? Come on, tell me. And don't give me some nonsense about it cuts off your oxygen supply or whatever. Be, all right. be honest. Why don't you wear a mask? Because you just don't feel like it. Well, maybe you won't feel like it when they try and incubate you in the hospital. Or maybe you won't feel like being at the funeral of the person who you gave COVID-19 to. We're not asking for much. Put on the, you know, what's the phrase in Nova Scotia? Put on the laces, put on the mask, whatever, I don't know. Put on the mask. Social distance. We can still do things. This is the thing that, for me, is the eternal source of frustration, is if you just do these simple things, it's not like we have to shut down the whole economy. You know, the way that some people talk is either or. Masks and social distancing are the economy. You can have both. If you have common sense, if you have wisdom, if you have an awareness, you can, you know, you can still do the things that are part of your life if the numbers are not too high. But when they get too high, boom, shut down. And then everyone wonders, why did it happen? Or we see in, like, in Australia just now, apparently there's a whole bunch of violent protests over mask mandates. We hear the horror stories coming out of the States of school boards ending in violence because parents don't want their kids to wear masks. And people die. We as a congregation established the protocols because we care. And I really appreciate the support that we've had from our congregation in these actions. I really appreciate our willingness to work with that. I appreciate the fact we have such a big building so we can social distance like this. Those, pla those folks who built this congregation knew what was going to happen and they were like, Yep, we're ready, folks. And I appreciate you all wearing your masks. 
And, you know, I appreciate that despite the temptations, for the most part, we're, we're relatively well behaved during the socializing. We, may, we might need, and including myself, I, I, I'm guilty as charged, but we are working on it. And so I really appreciate the effort that you folks have made. And it's an interesting reminder that as a faith community, we have a better understanding half the time than, say, other elements of society. You know, we're supposed to just be trusting in God, right? And God's like, yeah, good on you folks. So, that's my... <laughs> okay, he's done his rant. Now we can get on with the service. If there are to be people of God, Christians have to first become a people. That is a network of living communities, working out their understandings, planning their courses of action, and organizing themselves for action. We shall begin our worship with There's a Voice in the Wilderness, Voices United 18. has approached God in prayer. We gather in prayer before God. Today we hold in our prayers the people of Afghanistan, people fearful for their future, people who have been abandoned. God, may we be their voice in the world 
And may, and may we offer what care and support we can to your people in need. Let us take part in the sharing of the Oscar Romero prayer. It helps now and then to step back and take the long view. We accomplish in our lifetime only a fraction of the magnificent enterprise that is God's work. No statement says that all could be said. No power fully, no prayer fully expresses our faith. No confession brings perfection. No pastoral visit brings wholeness. No program accomplishes the church's mission. No set of goals and objectives includes everything. We plant the seeds that one day will grow. We water the seeds already planted, knowing that they will hold future promise. We lay foundations that will need further development. We provide yeast that provides effects far beyond our capabilities. It may be incomplete, but it is a beginning, a step along the way, an opportunity for the Lord's grace to enter and do the rest. We may never see the end results, but that is the difference between the master builder and the worker. We are prophets of a future not our own. Let us enter into a time of confession. When we receive forgiveness instead of judgment, we too are made ready to forgive each other. What God does for us, we owe to one another. Loving God, you invite us into your sanctuary. Yet sometimes we wonder if we are worthy to be here. We feel the weight of our burdens, our uncertainty. Yet we God have mercy. God have mercy. In silence, we open our hearts to God. We are touched with grace. We are loved. Let us give thanks with prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. Our next hymn is for the healing of nations, Voices United 678. That's 678. <laughs> Thank you. 
<laughs> I was uh, at the start of the service uh, someone was asked me about the reading and I was joking that I've, maybe I should make it as an arbitrary rule that um, since it's a reading from the book of prophets it should be read by the Scottish minister to you know, put the right amount of Calvinist doom and gloom and you know, scaring the bejesus out of people a reading from the book of Isaiah and I'll try and stop living up to Scottish stereotypes a reading from the book of Isaiah a voice cries out, In the wilderness prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice says, cry out. And I said, what shall I cry? All people are grass. Their constancy is like the flower of the field. The grass withers, the flower fades. And the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. But the world... The word of our God shall stand forever. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. 
What does it mean to have hope in these days? The crisis in Afghanistan, a massive earthquake in Haiti, the reality of a fourth wave of COVID-19, wildfires throughout North America, the consequences of climate change around the globe, growing desperation as a result of growing income inequality. The list is endless. And once more, the question is, what does it mean to have hope? One thing I've reflected on is, what does it mean? What do we mean by hope? And I think that may be part of our challenge. In the conversation I had this week, uh, we were talking about hope and expectations. I was reflecting on, as I've mentioned in the past, the difference between reading Greek mythology as a kid and Greek mythology as an adult. One of the more <laughs> safer well, yeah, in differences is the legend of Pandora's box. When you hear it as a kid, this idea of hope that remains in the box, so hope still stays with us and all this kind of stuff and everything's great. But then as an adult, you realize it's a box of evils. Or it's a vase of evils. It's actually a vase, not a box. But anyway, you know, it's a vase filled with evils and hope's one of these evils. It's like, huh? Why did no one tell me that as a kid? And then some people have realized that what that means, it's not so much hope, but it's expectations. And I think this is part of the challenge that we have is what, we're, what we think is hope is actually our expectations of what's going to happen. And then when those ex expectations don't come to pass, we get annoyed, we get upset, we struggle. And sometimes we are so busy being annoyed and whatever, we don't notice the glimpses of hope that could change everything. I actually had a just this week, I had a practical example of that, of the difference between hope and expectations. A book I'd been waiting for for quite a while now, uh, Other Side Picnic, Volume 5, finally arrived. And I had been really eager for one of the stories because I'd heard some you know, previews and the like from people. And I had very high expectations of this particular story. My expectations were not fulfilled. Instead, the story went in a completely different direction and it was actually far more meaningful than I had hoped for, than I expected. This is for me the mystery of hope, especially hope in difficult days. The resolution we expect may not happen. It might not even be possible. Yet too often we have clung on to our expectations because we're fearful of the alternatives. We may have to give up so much. Then hope slips in, opens us to the new possibilities that as the world struggles, we may still be part of better days. This is very much at the heart of the book of Isaiah as we hear in today's reading. Now, one of the things about scripture, one of the, it's kind of the separation points between mainstream churches and evangelicals and fundamentalists and the like, is our awareness that scripture itself is an organic process. That a book we read, in the, in the book of Isaiah is the classic example. Isaiah as a prophet existed in the 8th century BCE, but much of the book was also written considerably later. You know, parts of the book were written 500 BC and some even later. It is still called the book of Isaiah and I think traditionally many people still think it's all the work of Isaiah himself. But what we actually have is the original work then being reinterpreted during the con context that they were living in. So, Isaiah himself was a prophet active in the kingdom of Judah in the 8th century BCE. 
He had witnessed the destruction of Israel, the kingdom of Israel, and Judah itself being reduced to a client state of the Assyrians. Assyria, sorry, Isaiah had been called by God to be the word of God who would challenge the rulers of Judah over their failure to uphold the covenant between God and the community of Israel. Isaiah would speak on behalf of the people who had been oppressed by the corrupt rulers of, uh, of the land and would proclaim a day of judgment when the kingdom would be destroyed. But as well as judgment and lament, there was also hope that the covenant would be restored, a new community would arise that would live in mutual relationship with God, a community that had learned from the mistakes of the past. The first words were written down probably in the 8th century. And they were treasured by the people. And then when the kingdom of Judah was itself destroyed in, in the 580s BCE, and Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed, the surviving elites were dragged off into exile, taking with them the words of Isaiah. Maybe they wondered, could they still share in the hope of Isaiah in these difficult days as they sat by the rivers of Babylon and wept? For some, the answer was a resounding yes. But the question would be, what is the nature of this hope? Was it the expectation that God would act to merely restore the kingdoms of Judah and Israel to their supposed former glories if the ruling elites remembered this time to behave better? And some did convince themselves this is what Isaiah had meant. But as far as what I believe is that it was more of an expectation than a hope. An expectation that God shared in their desires of what the kingdom of Judah would be like. That the kingdom of Judah would be a power in the world dominating over others. Not a vision of the hope of God revealed in the community of Israel being a witness to what it means to live in relationship with God and with one another. Indeed, when I read of the people who wanted a restoration of the kingdom but nicer, I was reminded of what Gandalf says to Denifor, the steward of Gondor, in the return of the king. Denifor pompously declares that the future of the free, people, the free peoples of Middle-earth depends solely on the survival of Gondor, the great powerful realm. Gandalf responds, The rule of, realm, of no realm is mine neither of Gondor nor of any other, great or small. But of all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail of my task, though Gondor should perish. If anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in the days to come, for I am also a steward. Did you not know? What we hear in Gandalf's is a vision of hope rooted in his care for the people of Middle-earth. Kingdoms may fall, but good will prevail if the people care for one another in the world that they're part of. This is a vision of hope that the exiles in Babylon will struggle with, as they struggle with the trauma that their kingdom has fallen. This is a community that has had its certainties ripped away from them, their belief in their God taken away by the actions of the Babylonians. Or that's what they have been led to believe. But it will be in exile they will discover through exploring the mystery of hope that something will grow fair in the days that lie ahead. It may not be the restoration of the mighty power of the kingdom of Judah and Israel, which was actually a figment of their imagination. But the vision of a community of hope. 
as they engage with the words of Isaiah, they will discover that their fears will not be realized, that the story of their relationship with God is not, not, is not over. Indeed, it is now going to flourish with new opportunities because they now have a new vision of hope. No longer dependent on the whims of kings, priests, and their ilk. Surely the people are grass. The grass withers, the flower fades. I believe here what Isaiah is referring to is the inconsistency of kings, priests, and their ilk. Who build their mighty statues and temples and courts, declaring that they will exist forever. And in time will be dust in the wind. If you want um, a recreation of that, then go to YouTube, uh, type in Breaking Bad and Ozymandias, and you will hear that wonderful prayer read from that moment. But that vision that these are people who have, been in the, the context of Judah and Israel, they declared they were acting in the name of God. They had declared that it is God's will we have dominion over others. And God was like, excuse me? Where did you get that? Power over others? Don't remember that part. The writers of today's passage, the Deutero Isaiah, we see sometimes refer to them, the later writers, what they hope to accomplish was to speak to a people who are struggling with the questions such as, what happens now? What does it mean to have hope as we face the uncertainty of exile? Can we continue to have hope that we are the beloved of God? We are the people who are being punished. We fail to live up to the hope of God. The thing that needs to be stressed it is not the whole population of Judah in exile. It's the elites. So, let's give a modern example. Say Canada decides to invade and conquer the United States. And we burn, well, no, you didn't burn down Washington. It was the British. I really, I can't stand that when Canadians claim to burn down the White House because you didn't. So Canada decides to burn down the White House and all the great buildings. You don't deport the whole population to Manitoba. You take all Hollywood, the members of Congress, and the top, you know, the, 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 the billionaires. You gather them and you dump them in Winnipeg. That's what happened. The, you know, the vast bulk of the U.S. population, <laughs> the vast bulk of the population of Judah remained in Judah. The elites were the ones who were in exile. So they're the population. They're the ones who made the decisions. They're the ones who ruled the land. And so there is an awareness that they are the ones who destroyed the relationship between God and the covenant. And in the Babylonian exile, they reel the folly of their, mistake, their, of their judgment. They change. In the exile, hope begins with a people who are fully aware of why they face their the present struggles. The elites in Babylon know they did this. They were the ones who put their faith in other things. And the rest of the people suffered because of their actions. And so when they try to restore a vision of hope, they first have to come to terms of their own complicitness. And it is hope that we can change. We can let go of our expectations of what we hope for. We can let go of our desire to get back to normal and embrace a vision of how God's hope in the world, may, God's hope in us may change the world. And in doing so, we will see glimpses of hope, not so much as the dramatic actions of God from hope on high, or the hope that technology or a new way of life will fix all our problems. And it is certainly not the hope that we too often place in politicians, business leaders, or celebrities who offer us a plan that fix, will fix everything if we follow them. 
No, it's, it is hope for the people around us, willing to do something to make the world a better place, actions that will be a living witness to the wonder of God's hope amongst us. And that we can be that sign of hope ourselves. The little things that we do to make a difference. The care and compassion we show for one another. The willingness to reach out to the lost and broken of this world and say, what can we do for you? It is the hope that people are willing to care for one another, whatever the circumstances. It is the hope that people will ignore the barriers that separate us from one another and reach out to those in need. What can we do? I'd like to close with a quote. I discovered it 20 years ago. And I've used it quite a few times, and I'm sure I've used it here. On the surface, the fact that the quote continues to be relevant may seem somewhat pessimistic. But I disagree. For me, it is a reminder of the continuity of hope. That yes, the world will always struggle. Yet, there will always be people who will embrace hope and do what they can to make their hope a living reality in this world. Hope in a time such as this. Take hope in the witness of those who have been willing to risk their lives in the service of others. If times of violence and suffering remind us of the human capacity for sin, they also remind us that that such sin can never obliterate the image of God in which we have all been created. We have seen such reminders in the actions of the firefighters and rescue workers in New York and Washington, and as I would add, our healthcare workers in the face of COVID-19. And in the relief and rescue workers in Afghanistan and Pakistan, we will see much of that work in the next few months. We are reminded that such witnesses may be offered not only in the heroic acts by which lives are risked and saved, but also in the small acts of kindness which turn aside hate and fear. Take hope in the fall of Babylon, in a time when some are zealous to draw distinctions between supposedly legal and moral violence of the state and illegal and immoral violence of non-state groups, we may offer reminders that the judgment of God is arrayed against all of the rebellious principalities and powers. Our allegiance is to God, not the state. Take hope in the witness of the remnant who speak for peace, that ragtag assortment of the faithful who believe that peace is possible when all about proclaim that it is not. And above all, take hope in Christ crucified and resurrected. It is the resurrection which is the terror of God to all who believe that death should have the final word. It is the promise of resurrection which renders null and void the victories of all who shed blood. Terror surrounded the life of Jesus like a great parentheus. At his birth, Herod pursued him with slaughter, and in his crucifixion, he shared the fate of condemned slaves and others of low esteem. But Jesus was not contained by the terror. For his birth and his resurrection, messengers from God proclaimed to all who would hear, do not be afraid. It is with those words of reassurance that we might be empowered to live our lives and to the witness to the love of God take hope. Amen. At this time of our service, a reminder that we, we do not take an offering during the service. We have an offering plate at the back. And as a reminder, we give our thanks to all those who offer their gifts of time, talent, and treasure to be part of the continuing witness of uh, Strathairn United Church to our hope in the kingdom of God. Let us approach God in prayer. For thus says the Lord, that when you call upon me and come and pray to me, I will hear you. 
God, we thank you for all good things, for life and love, for health and food, for work and home, for nature's beauty and comfort, for human skills and laughter, for memory and hope, for our connections with one another. And in silence, we bring our thanks prayers of thanksgiving to you, O God. God, we pray for your creation, the world we live in. We pray for the people of Afghanistan, the people of Haiti, for those in North America struggling with forest fires, for people around the globe in the fourth wave of COVID-19, for all who suffer in conflicts, internal or war, we pray for all who endure oppression of the many forms that we create. We pray for those who struggle in difficult days, for those who cry out for justice, for those who search for hope, for those who yearn for healing, for those who live their lives hoping for better days. God, the world that we have shaped fails to be the world that you hoped for from us. Yet you continue to have faith that we will be your witness to your love for all. So God, we pray that you will renew us and fill us with your justice, your strength, and your compassion. And in doing so, we will be the people who reach out to the lost of this world and say, you are not alone. Let it begin with prayer as, God, we come to you with the prayers of our hearts. For those who we know who struggle with illness of the mind, body, and spirit. For those who grieve. For those who are alone. For those who yearn for connection. In silence we bring these names to you. Our closing hymn is Arise, Your Light Has Come, Voices United 79. The Spirit of God is upon us because God has anointed us. God send us as a herald of joy to the humble to bind up the wounded of heart 
to proclaim release to the captives, liberation to the imprisoned. Amen. Go now in peace. Thank you.